Cool. So, thanks everybody. Um, happy to be here. Happy to give this presentation. The title of the presentation will be Security in Software Development. So briefly kind of walk you through how the presentation is going to go today. So we have obviously introductions about me, a little bit more about my background, what I've done, what I've done, what I'm currently doing. And then we'll dive into the actual overview of all things software development and security at the same time. From there, we'll move into talking about the specific rate relationships you need to cultivate in order to have a successful software security program. And then from there, we'll move into the actual technical security aspects, including static analysis as well as dynamic testing. And from there, we'll wrap everything up, and then I'll open the floor up to questions if there are any. So a little more about me. I graduated from KSU in May of 2016 with a degree in information security and assurance. During the time I spent um, here, I also interned as a sysadmin. Um, for a smaller engineering firm and competed on the team, school's CCDC team. Uh, I believe we placed second that year, if I'm not mistaken. Um, after that, I worked for a medium to small size consulting company called Metatology Services, where we were specifically focused on healthcare security. So I've worked with 90% of all the major health systems and hospitals in the Atlanta and Georgia area, doing pen tests, risk assessments, stuff of that nature. From there, I also acquired my OSCP during my time, which was a task and a half. After that, I moved on to doing product security with a company called Ionic Security. Um, currently there, I work with my manager to sort of provide the dynamic testing aspect of um, the product security focus, as well as general pen testing services, since that's inside my wheelhouse to do. But the real reason you came here. So software security and development. How do we do it? How do we do it well? And how do we leave feeling like we won't be awake at night, anxious as can be, about the 10,000 vulnerabilities that could exist in our code? And the, we all start with the software development lifecycle. And the question is, where does security belong in the SDLC? And the answer is everywhere. However, you may or may not have the resources to put security everywhere in the SDLC. For some, for some organizations it may be easier to get in front of it on the planning side, and they may not have the technical resources to be doing the dynamic testing and validation that needs to be done on the back end, or they may not have the static analysis capabilities. It really depends on how the organization in question is structured and the skill set and personnel that are located within that organization. The other thing we're trying to do here is we're trying to reach 95% certainty. There's always the 5% chance that we will not catch everything. It's just not possible. It's, um, we just want to be 95% certain that we will catch everything that comes across. And the 5% chance that we don't, well, it's an unfortunate margin of error that we just have to live with and it's just the nature of the business. Um, and lastly, how do we cover that 5% gap? If we know that we're gonna have gaps, how are we going to respond to incidents? How are we going to deal with incidents as they come up? And essentially, what are we going to do in the event that that 5% becomes a reality and then we're forced to deal with it on a daily basis for a time? So human security and relationships. Having excellent relationships with the three major parties, one being leadership, the second being engineering, and the third being operations. Having well thought out leaderships, or leaderships, well thought out relationships will make your lives a lot easier. Um, these three parties all make your job way easier because they hold the keys to the rest of the castle. You are more than likely going to be working on a very specific subset of the entire organization, and you don't want to be viewed as entirely a cost sink. Um, good relationships will make your problems better. Bad ones definitely won't make it any better, and will oftentimes make it worse, where people don't want to come to talk to you when they know that there are problems, when people don't want to come and you know, seek your guidance out when they know they're coming on an issue that they don't know. And start, it all starts with leadership. Leadership controls the money. So they control how you're gonna be able to spend your budget, how your budget's going to be structured, and the overall support for the program from the top down. If you don't have leadership buy-in for the information security program, it's going to be a lot harder to accomplish your objective of reaching that 95% certainty threshold. From there, um, it's also become much easier in previous in years prior to gain support for a program just simply because of major publicized breaches such as Equifax, such as um, all of the other very sorry, all of the other various um, massive breaches that have occurred over the last few years, and no one wants to end up in the news, which 
is a good thing, even if it isn't for you know the best reasons sometimes. Um, metrics are very important to actually getting leadership buy-in. Metrics are the way that you show demonstrable action. Here's what we've been doing. Here's what we're going to be doing, and here's how we've progressed over the last six months. If you can give them an actionable plan to act on, it will make their lives a lot easier, and thus make them easier for them to support you in all of your endeavors across the organization. Um, decision, making, decision making needs to be driven by policy. You need a robust policy core and framework to go anywhere, because if people don't have a policy that they're being forced to follow, chances are they're going to cut corners wherever possible. Lastly, find other ways to generate value. Oftentimes, information security as a whole is viewed as a sink for the business. But there are things you can pull out of it by working with the compliance department to attain various certifications that you can then market to your customers as saying, oh, we're ISO 27001 or 002 certified, or well, we have, um, we're HIPAA accredited or, or high trust certified, or whatever certification may be relevant for your given industry. Next, we have engineering. These are the people that are going to be actually developing the software itself. Um, there needs to be mutual understanding between you and the engineers. They need to know what you're going to be doing, and you need to understand what they're going to be doing. Um, they need to know what your role is within the business, how you're going to accomplish your goals, and basically what the expectations are between communication and other thought processes that go, in, that go into planning and developing software. Um, you're going to need SLAs. SLAs between engineering and information security will make your lives incredibly easy. Because if you say, oh, we have a high-risk vulnerability that came in, um, either a public program or is internally discovered, um, we have X amount of days to resolve it based on the SLA we have with, with you. And that needs to be thought out well between the engineering, engineering and infor information security department and then improved by all people. Because if you have an SLA that one side can't agree to, what you're going to end up happening is you're going to expose yourselves to more risk and then open up the possibility that your customer's data or whoever's data is held inside of your software might be compromised. Um, lastly, you need to understand what the customer's expectations around security are. If you don't think that the customers are expecting the app to be any kind of secure and they understand that there's going to be you know, insecure data flowing through the application, does it make sense to actually spend the money and go through and secure it and test it properly? Maybe not. On the other hand, if you're dealing with incredibly sensitive information, such as credit card numbers, social security numbers, really any kind of sensitive PII or PHI even, you kind of want to spend the time and the money and resources to go through and actually evaluate the security position of that application. Next, guide remediation. You know more, your chances are you're going to know a little bit more about security than a good portion of your developers, and that's fine. But also keep in mind that they're going to know probably a little bit more about development than you do, given that that's their day in and day out. Don't necessarily tell them exactly what to do, but tell them, you know, based on your opinion, where you think they should go. Oftentimes, if you come from a place of humility, it will make your interactions with engineering a lot easier. Next, education. View education as preventative maintenance. If you will educate your users on secure coding practices, it will make everything easier because they will already have a baseline for understanding, that, oh, maybe I shouldn't pass raw input to the SQL query. Or, you know, maybe I should validate any user input that comes into the application, both on the server side and the client side. Next, we have operations. So these are the people that are going to actually be operationalizing your software in a given environment. They will have the first-hand knowledge of how to deploy it, how it's deployed, and everything such as that. The most, you could build the most secure application in the world, and if the machine it's running on has not changed its default password ever, does not matter how secure that code is because all of the data is going to be compromised very quickly. Automation makes everybody happy. If you can automate as much of the operations process into your own where your security scans and your security jobs are going to be automatically called by them when they build, their when they build the applications themselves, everyone will be happier because that's less work that they have to do on their end to notify you, and it's less work that you have to do to manually sift through all of the complexities of that manually scanning software. Next, you can identify infrastructure problems, similar to what I spoke of before, default passwords that aren't changed, operating systems that are out of date, 
anything of that nature that could be a problem with the infrastructure, which could potentially compromise the application of the software running on that infrastructure. Next, you need to analyze your service communication and your external footprint. So how much of the application is actually being exposed to the internet? Is it just port 443 on HTTPS? Is it something else? Are you running you know, dynamic ports or high ports in the 40,000 range? Is there anything like that out there that they might know of that you might necessarily catch at the first glance? And examine your internal service, internal service communication. As we all know, um, the NSA had access into, inside of Google's data centers for forever. And Google did not encrypt their data until they found out, found out their transmissions until they found out after about it. Because you don't think that you, know, you need to encrypt data between various service communications until you actually sit down and realize that you need to assume that the system itself is compromised. And when you adopt that defense in depth strategy, it makes everything a lot easier. Lastly, procedures. Everybody hates writing procedures, but procedures will save you in the long run when you have that one-off incident that you don't know how you're supposed to react to. If you can sit down, think about them beforehand, put together an actionable plan that you can move forward with, it will make everyone's lives a lot better because they instantly know what they should be doing at a given time. Next, we move on to technical security and what I actually deal with on a more regular basis. Um, so, so what are the tools of the trade? So what kind of software are you using? Are you using Burp Suite for your dynamic analysis? Are you using check marks for your static analysis? Are you using any of the other 10,000 products that are out there that'll claim to do one thing or another? Do they actually have the capability to scan your Angular JavaScript application? Probably not. Do they have the capabilities to actually analyze whatever programming language you may have? Hopefully so. Um, lastly, do you have the personnel needed to actually utilize the pieces of software that you bought? If you bought $10,000, if you bought $10,000 worth of tool, but have no one to operate them aside from the board says admin who does it on the side, chances are you're not going to be in a very good security posture. Lastly, you need to be able to do risk assessments of the vulnerabilities that you identified. Is this something that needs to be remediated immediately ASAP? Is it something that can wait a little while? Is it something that ever needs to be fixed at all? Is it worthwhile the trouble to have engineering or operations go through and fix the problems that have occurred? Are there other gaps, other ways you can cover them? You know, can they be protected by something like a web application firewall, which would basically band-aid it and give you time to actually draw up a critical a resolution that sticks with the application permanently, as opposed to just a temporary stopgap? Next, we're going to move into static analysis. So automation is very important here because automation on static analysis will let you spend more time actually analyzing the vulnerabilities that are reported by the code and less time trying to get the code through the scanner in the first place. And having seen the size of some massive applications, millions upon millions of lines of code, it can often take several hours for a complete scan of that code to finish. And as such, you don't want to be sitting there spending an hour configuring it trying to get it to run every time, when you could have this all automated to be hauled automatically as soon as your engineers are ready, ready a build for operations. Dealing with false positives. No tool is perfect. As a matter of fact, most tools are imperfect. They're going to give you false positives, usually a lot of them. But err on the side of caution. If you really think that something needs to be investigated further, look into the surrounding code, look where the issue is coming from. Is it coming from a, a startup script that's run on the device? Is it coming from actually with deep within the code on a critical service? Having that kind of contextual knowledge around the vulnerabilities that were discovered will go a long way towards providing a more holistic view of what the security of the application actually is. Outside reviews are going to be helpful. People who do not view your application every day and who specialize in this type of stuff will come up with differing opinions and new ways of thinking about it because the more eyes you can have on the software, the better off you're likely going to be. Lastly, you need to complete the puzzle with dynamic testing. Anything that you find in static analysis is just that. It's a potential, it's a potential issue. You don't know if it actually exists. The runtime that could be reported as a SQL injection vulnerability could not actually be reachable by human input. It could be somewhere else completely. It could be only exposed on the back end by um, some operations personnel. Do you still need to fix it? Probably, but it just changed the level of risk associated with that given vulnerability. Lastly, dynamic testing, what I get to do every day that I absolutely enjoy. Um, the hunt for vulnerabilities. So you need to do fuzzing. You need to be able to submit you know, random input, be it the 
free emoji string that crashed an iPhone a few months back, or you know, some random Arabic characters that your application may not be designed to interpret. Because you're trying to induce vulnerabilities. You're trying to induce error, the application to respond in a way that it is not intended. Last, next, once you find that actual issue where it throws up an error code, say it doesn't respond correctly, or you're expecting a 403 response code, and you end up getting a 200, naturally you're going to want to investigate that to see if there's anything actually there. And from there, once you've identified it, confirm that it actually exists. Retry it again and again until you're 100% certain that what you're dealing with is a vulnerability and needs to, be uh, needs to be dealt with. After that, can you actually get anything out of the vulnerability? You could have a SQL injection vulnerability in your application, but when you exploit it, it doesn't return anything useful. It could just be returning, say, publicly, publicly available information that is stored within the application that you have to have for processing purposes. Is that going to be the same level of severity as something that gives you authentication bypass to the application? Absolutely not. You're going to treat that differently and you're going to guide the remediation for the teams differently. After that, we come to remediation. So how are we going to respond to this? Is this a tier one, needs to be fixed by tonight? Or can you stretch it out? Can you give engineering more time so to get to their other priorities? Because they're going to be busy teams. I've never met a software shop that hasn't been busy almost 24 seven aside from code freeze time come the holidays. After that, the most important thing is to know what application that you're testing. You need to be able to recognize, okay, this is where our problem areas are. These are the pieces of code that someone wrote three months ago on a whim and left in there and then forgot about it. Um, because that will happen, especially with applications at scale where you have multiple developers working on one code base. You're going to find stuff where someone hacked together a solution or hacked together a, a, a problem or something occurred that they threw together something overnight, it worked, and then suddenly it became part of the code permanently. Which features are going to be deprecated? What stuff is no longer going to be used? Because there's no point in applying the same lens to something you know is going to be taken out of the application in a month as something that's going to be there indefinitely. And who's in charge of what? If I discover a vulnerability on the front end of the application, who on the engineering team do I need to go talk to? Who makes the most sense? It doesn't make sense to go talk to a back-end developer about a UI experience. They're, not going, they're going to look at you and then politely redirect you to their colleague across the aisle. Next, going back similar to what I spoke of previously, the more eyes you can get on the application, the better. If you only have one person testing your application for the entirety of the year, you don't do any outside code reviews, any external pen tests, anything like that, chances are you're going to miss stuff because that one person has only their point of view. They know probably the white box method of testing where they know everything is possible about the application. Whereas if you can get someone who understands, you know, maybe doesn't understand the full footprint of the application, they're being exposed for the first time, they're going to attack it differently. They're going to go after it in a way that the other individual may not think to. It's just going to be common sense that the more eyes you can get on something, you're going to get differing, you're going to get differing opinions, you're going to get differing points of view, and you're probably going to discover more about the application than you previously thought. Lastly, as we come to the conclusion of it, um, no software product is perfect. If someone claims to write perfect, completely secure code, chances are they're trying to sell you something. If security belongs everywhere in the SDLC, you need to figure out where it makes sense to insert it in your particular organization. If you can get in front of it during the planning stages, excellent. That'll make your lives a lot easier and you'll head off problems later on down the road. Maybe you can't though. Maybe for whatever political reasons you can't talk directly to engineering or you don't have that kind of relationship with the engineering leads to go to them and say, what are you going to be working on for this next sprint or whatever you're having? That's understandable, but you have to understand that you have to cover that gap somewhere else in the, in the line. So if you can't do that, but maybe you have an excellent team of pen testers who can go at the application 24 seven or at least eight five, um, then it'll make your lives a lot easier. Relationships are going to matter as much as technical proficiency. I always joked that I got into this industry and this business because I didn't like dealing with people, and I spend about 80% of my time dealing with people instead of actually working on computers. Lastly, static and dynamic testing are needed. Static testing will catch problems, but it can only be validated by dynamic testing, and dynamic testing will catch stuff such as business logic errors and other stuff that static code analysis just will not find. Um, the dynamic testing is probably as important. I wouldn't put either one of them above the other just because you're going to find stuff that the other one will not catch, and that's what we're trying to do to reach that 95% certainty goal of giving secure software to our customers 
and giving software that they know won't leave them exposed completely wide open to the organization. And I believe that's everything. Any questions? So what do you think the biggest barrier is for this kind of collaborative uh, environment that you need to So the, probably definitely the biggest barrier is going to be, um, I like to pick on the engineers a little bit, but the engineers tend to have their own personality set, and they typically don't like to have meetings ever, if at all. And if you find the developer that does like having meetings, congratulations, you found the holy grail. Um, and if you can't quite get that relationship built or you can't do anything like that, I find that coming to them and asking them questions specifically about their software or what they're working on or if there's anything that they can, you can help with or anything that you, they know that you need to be testing, more, more so than other areas, that'll slowly start to build that relationship. And building that relationship will go a long way towards actually making us that 95% certainty goal more attainable.